I guess uh, is the sound on? Yes, you can hear me in the back. So and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come here today, and thank you very much for the nice word, uh, Elizabeth. And uh, I think that uh, I don't know if Aalborg University should be proud of having fostered me, but at least I'm uh, I'm happy and proud of being fostered by Aalborg University. And uh, I had the opportunity to arrive all late, already uh, last night, and uh, and uh, I'm staying at that uh, uh, first uh, hotel, Aalborg, over there. And uh, last night I just went for a stroll around uh, the city and. Uh, what a fantastic place Aalborg has become uh, in the past uh, 20 years since I uh, left the city. So uh, I saw small cafes, I saw small restaurants, I saw uh, a lively city center and not one of those, you know, ghost towns where everything's deserted after 5.30 in the afternoon. Uh, of course, there was also Champions League on in, uh, in the student house, so the students were watching that and uh, being very excited, and the girls were sitting in the back and drinking beer, and the guys were sitting in front uh, having, uh, having a drink and stuff like that. So that was very nice. And then the, uh, the, the harbor front here has also really transformed and been, become really, really nice, right? So, uh, so when I lived here, I lived uh, not too far from here, up on uh, Østerbro and uh, Langeskade, Bratislavillegade, just next to... Uh, Caroline alone, and at that time there was Quator here, and this was a place where you would not really go down here unless you, ha you had some, some serious uh, business here, right? That was also in the wake of the closing down of the, uh, the, the, um, um, the shipyard, uh, so of course uh, there was a massive unemployment sea and, and these kind of things. So I'm very happy to see, and thank you for this opportunity to come back to, to Aalborg. I come here uh, to uh, Seldom. But actually, I also was here just last week, and at that time, I gave a presentation over in Utsun House, which was also really nice, and they had a, a beautiful, uh, nice place. But unfortunately, like here, my slides were covering the fantastic view. But then you can also say again that uh, maybe on a day like this, this is a good day to cover the view, because maybe this is not the view that we like to be reminded of, right? It's a little bit rainy, it's a little bit windy, and, and stuff like that. So, uh, so uh, what I'd like to come here to share with you today is some of the, the work that I've been doing and, uh, and uh, uh, I, my presentation will be a little bit uh, different from, uh, from Tony's presentation because Tony was very much uh, focusing on uh, using technology, using digital technologies as a means of instruction. What I would like to focus on is the changing skill set in terms of giving people digital skills in order to go out and uh, perform these things. I know that Tony also addressed that a little bit, uh, but I will put uh, a lot of uh, focus on that. Uh, then in terms of digitalization, isn't digitalization just the same as IT? And IT, you know, we've known for many years, actually for uh, quite a few decades. So uh, we've known IT since the 50s and the 60s, and there we would uh, use it very much for um, automating uh, and uh, making more effective uh, organizational processes. So it was usually computer scientists uh, such as myself uh, who would go out and then we would study the organization and see what was going on. And then we'd go back and then we would build an IT system that would support that. And, uh, and then we would install it, and uh, after a while, uh, um, we would uh, support more and more things. So that would be incremental. So every year, we would add a little more IT. So that is corresponds to, uh, you have a bug of water, it's uh, 55 degrees, then you add a little IT, and then it becomes 56 degrees. Then the year after you add more IT, it becomes 57 degrees, and everything is fine. Right, so, and this goes on for a long time, and we think this IT thing, we got it under control, it's the IT department, they know what they're doing. Uh, they may be a little bit late always, and they may also not always come up with the solutions that we uh, hope to have, uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, it's something that we got under control. But now, uh, if you look into the pot of water, you would see that there's a change happening, right? So uh, there are these small uh, air bubbles assembling in the water. And that indicates that this, uh, this uh, development will not uh, continue forever. We are facing a phase shift, uh, where we go from water's liquid form uh, to water's uh, air form, namely uh, steam. And those uh, uh, representations of water are very different. And that's what's happening now. There's so much IT present in the hands of uh, our customers, the, the students, uh, 
uh, among the uh, faculty, among the businesses, uh, and in society in general, that we can not just uh, continue what we already done. We are facing this uh, phase shift. We also know, for those of you who have an engineering background at least, that uh, the water uh, is much less potent than steam. Steam is much more full of energy, right? So that means that it's also easier to get burned. Uh, so uh, so uh, what we have is a much more uh, uh, vibrant uh, change agent in things. And things are happening much faster. So things that used to take years and decades are going uh, uh, much faster these days. So uh, I don't know even want to ask how many of you uh, have uh, mobile pay because I think that all of you have mobile pay. Uh, so uh, so that's one technology that came from nothing uh, to transforming the payment market in just uh, six months. So that means that uh, all businesses must be ready to react in a much shorter time. Uh, so, uh, so I know that uh, that there was a big uh, fight between uh, mobile pay and then there was also SWIP, uh, which was the contender uh, by all the other banks, right? But they were a little bit late, and they also uh, never really got to uh, to a situation where they really threatened uh, mobile pay. Uh, but there was one company that uh, weren't even part of this competition, to whom payment is really important, and who's that? Nets. Right. So, uh, so I think that uh, mobile pay came. Uh, it's actually six years ago these days in uh, 2013, and at that time, all the development cost for 2014 had already been allocated by Nets. So in 14, they were ready to allocate money to do a feasibility study in 15, and then in 15, they found out yes, we better do something about that. So in 16, they developed the um, mobile Dan court, and then in 17, they were ready to launch it. But at that time, the big Scandinavian uh, payment war was already over. So uh, what I want to say is that uh, in these times with uh, uh, digital technologies, uh, you cannot do what you usually do, namely by running these uh, three to five uh, year uh, strategy plans. Instead, you must try to navigate uh, differently. And the way you can do that is to have a, um, have a scenarios uh, in, on which you can be, you're able to um, to uh, implement within six to eight months. And then you have these other things, uh, which I call megatrends, that are things that will inevitably happen in the long run in the 10 to 15 uh, years time frame. Uh, and what I'll show you in a little while are three megatrends that I think will also have profound um, implications for the way that we do both university teaching, but also the topics that we teach our students, what are the capabil capabilities they, uh, they should have. Then uh, yesterday I gave a similar presentation to this one in uh, Aalborg University, Copenhagen, and after that I rushed to the uh, Danish Chamber of Commerce annual meeting. And, uh, and uh, Lars Løkke Rasmussen was there uh, as well, and you know, now the elections have begun. But what was interesting uh, was that uh, there was a number of references to the Danish uh, Disruption Council that uh, Elisabeth also uh, already have, uh, have uh, pointed to. Uh, so, uh, by the way, there was a good uh, thing he gave, was it 67 uh, billion kroners to welfare? So uh, I, don't, I think that uh, Meta Frederiks and the reason why she's in sickbed is thinking about how can she top that? Right, because uh, it's going to be a big uh, giveaway. And also uh, the 2% cuts that is every year being given to the Danish universities, uh, he abolished that and said that will not be there in the future. And I think that's uh, most welcome to many of our universities that are uh, suffering under these uh, massive cuts. Uh, but uh, but uh, two years ago, uh, to this date uh, almost, uh, the Danish prime minister uh, put down the disruption council. And uh, that was in uh, recognition that uh, because uh, we have this phase change uh, from water to steam, uh, then uh, the biggest threat to the Danish welfare society and the Danish uh, labor market is digitalization, globalization, and disruption. And uh, he wanted to be able to land that into a, um, into a, the, a Danish context context where we don't just uh, try to ignore it or uh, pretend that it's not happening, but instead try to land it to, in a way in which it transforms the Danish welfare society and also transforms the Danish uh, labor market model. So uh, what he did was he invited uh, seven other cabinet ministers uh, to join him, 
And then he also uh, asked uh, a number of the CEOs of uh, uh, Danish uh, leading businesses. I actually have a, a picture here. So you can see it's uh, Lars Lurke there in the middle, and then it's, uh, then it's uh, the CEO of uh, Metas. Uh, you know, uh, he's, he's there, and, uh, and uh, he was also on the Danish Chamber of Commerce uh, yesterday talking about how will Metas avoid being the next Fona? How will they avoid being the next, next uh, Feta BR? Right, uh, because uh, if he doesn't do anything, that's inevitably going to happen. Right, so uh, so uh, how can uh, how can he do that? What uh, what must he do? Uh, then we have another. We have uh, uh, Søren Skov, who's the CEO of uh, of Mask. Uh, we have Andrei Rogasevsky, who's uh, uh, a fellow student of mine. I have a computer science background from uh, from uh, from uh, from uh, Aalborg University, and he was a, a, a co-student there. And of course, he's uh, he's the founder of uh, Net Company. Uh, we also have the uh, CEO of uh, of um, um, uh, Lego, of uh, of uh, Universal Robotics, of uh, Microsoft, of CDC, uh, and uh, and uh, then we also have the uh, directors of the Danish Chamber of Commerce and the Danish Confederation of Danish Industries and the Danish Employers Association. In most countries, that would have made up the council, right? But since this is a Danish welfare society, where we have responsible uh, politicians and uh, and, um, uh, and and the people from the uh, trade unions, uh, then uh, we also uh, there was also invited uh, uh, the chairperson from uh, LO now FH, um, the Lisette Rieskov. There's also the chairwoman from FTF. There's the um, Danish Metal Workers uh, Union was also there. And you know, uh, it's fantastic when you have uh, 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 chairpersons from, uh, from uh, unions going out and saying, the best co-worker you can have is a robot, right? So that's taking a responsibility for, we cannot just say no and hope that this will go away. No, we have to find a way in which we can land this in. Of course, the alternative uh, for having no robots in Denmark is having no jobs. Right, because uh, then these robots will be put to work somewhere else. Right, and uh, what uh, Klaus Jensen of Danish Metal Workers Union is hoping is that these uh, robots can work with his members to uh, increase productivity, increase the skills level, and also thereby increasing the value created, which can be um, uh, exchanged into a higher salary uh, for the Danish metal workers. Uh, then we have a free uh, 3F, that's, uh, the, I guess it's the salaried workers in, in Denmark, and those are the ones that facilitate uh, or also house the, the taxi drivers, right? And I'll get back to that because we had a, a very interesting encounter between Uber and uh, 3F uh, at one of the meetings. Uh, and then, um, uh, I don't know if I forget, uh, uh, Hoko uh, was also there and, uh, and a few others. And these were pretty big meetings or long meetings, right? So we would start usually on a Monday at noon, and then we would continue until uh, Tuesday at noon. And it was only for the first two hours or something like that, we would have a journalist and, and guest. But otherwise, we would uh, kind of just take up our sleeves and find a way in which we could find common grounds in landing digitalization, globalization, and disruption uh, into Denmark. And I must admit that uh, sometimes when I looked at the newspapers the next day, I thought, was I at that same meeting? Because uh, uh, in the media, it was always uh, uh, put out uh, what the differences were. But when we were sitting there, and you can imagine when it was Lars Lurke, we had plenty of wine and beer, and, uh, and uh, we had a good time, and we would just sit down and discuss these things and, uh, and find uh, meaningful ways in which we could, uh, we could land this. I was then, uh, I was the, uh, the uh, there was two uh, academics or two uh, professors there. Uh, that was me as an IT professor, and then we had uh, uh, um, um, an uh, 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 economics professor from, uh, from Aarhus University. And I'll just uh, share with you some of the results we had. So, of course, uh, Tommy Ehlers was promoted to become uh, the new Minister of Research and Education, and uh, he is uh, crazy about digitalization and also startups and stuff like that, and I think that that's uh, an important quality to have in that uh, position. Then uh, there's a technology pact, more STEM candidates from higher education, and then uh, this uh, other thing was that we had the Nordic director of Uber, 
coming in and discussing uh, on the leadership of uh, Truls Lund Poulsen, uh, together with uh, with um, with uh, the salaried workers, uh, Pierre Christensen, who's, uh, who, who was there, right? And they didn't agree on many things, right? But one thing that was interesting was that many of the unions feel that uh, that uh, that we had to kick out uh, Uber is not a good situation, right? We would like to land in a platform company such as Uber into Denmark, that one that doesn't challenge and destroy the labor market and the Danish welfare society, but instead uh, supports it. So how can we do that? Because it was really a technicality that we got uh, rid of them by uh, insisting that they would put uh, uh, seat sensors in. Right? And if, if tax evasion is one of the reasons why we didn't want Uber, then why do we have seat sensors in the more conventional taxis? Right? It's not because uh, taxis have always paid all their taxes uh, in good faith, right? It's because that has also been uh, flawed in, in the long run. And then the other thing was uh, the request for taxi meters. So, uh, so they had an argument, and, uh, and the idea is that uh, many of these platforms, they say that they just facilitate the matching of somebody who would like to go for a ride with somebody who would like to drive them, right? And uh, after that, they don't have any re responsibilities. But I think that uh, we have to find a way in which we can make sure that, uh, that, uh, that these uh, platforms assume some kind of employer responsibility. Right? So, uh, so what happened was that uh, that Paulson Paulsen had, uh, uh, was uh, charged with the thing that he should go back and facilitate bilateral discussions between the platform uh, companies and the, uh, the union. And then it's around a year ago uh, these days, uh, he came back and was uh, proud to announce the world's first trade agreement between a union and a platform uh, company, uh, namely the one between Hilfer and, uh, and, uh, and uh, 3F. And the thing is that that stipulates when does, uh, 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 when does Hilfer, Hilfer is a platform where if you need some painting done or you want need some small work done in the garden or you need some cleaning or stuff like that, then you would go on to Hilfer and then you could acquire uh, people there. But then it says if you over a longer period of time has ha have had the main income from this platform, then Hilfer will uh, give you, uh, will assume some uh, employer responsibility. So uh, many times when you work for these platforms, you're self-employed, and that means that if you fall ill for some reason, then uh, you do not have any uh, income. Right? So uh, what uh, Hilfer is, uh, is uh, now offering is a, a, an insurance in terms of uh, sick leaves. Then they also make sure that you pay your taxes, also they help uh, avoid social fraud, and also they help, uh, for instance, that people can pay into their pension fund, uh, etc. So, uh, so that echoes uh, not only in Denmark, but also across uh, Europe, that there's uh, been found a way, because what the politicians are really, really afraid of is what they can see in France. I don't know if you can imagine uh, a disruption council of, uh, let's just say, the, the employer side was the same, and then on the uh, employee side, it would be people in yellow vests. Uh, I think that that would be a, a bloody council uh, where uh, there would be some uh, cutthroating. Um, uh, so, uh, um, um, yeah. Um, the other thing that has happened is that, uh, that there has come uh, uh, the, first, uh, the world's first agreement, tax agreement, with Airbnb. So, uh, so Airbnb is looking with, uh, that's another platform, of course, um, where they match people that would like a, a place to stay with uh, somebody who would like to rent out a room or a flat or something like that. Um, so, uh, so they were looking at uh, what was happening to Uber across uh, places in Europe, and then they also looked at, uh, at Germany, where again there has been this technicality put in place, where uh, if you rent out through um, uh, Airbnb, it must be for at least one month. And then of course, uh, uh, Airbnb cannot exist because it's for a few days or a week or something like that. And then also in the Netherlands, uh, you can only rent out for 20 days. So, uh, so what was the, uh, the agreement here was that, uh, that Airbnb uh, can, uh, will um, supply automatically or electronically uh, to the tax authorities how much money is being made by renting out this uh, flat. 
Uh, and, uh, and the incentive for the uh, homeowners is that if they use a platform, not just Airbnb, but any platform that automatically reports to the tax authorities, then you can <laughs> they can rent out the flat for 70 to 100 days. And that's up to each municipality to decide whether they would like uh, to allow 100 days or just 70 days. And I can imagine like Aalborg, Aarhus, Copenhagen, they would probably go for 70 days. Whereas uh, if you go up to Lurken or Blockhus or Frederikshavn or something like that, they are probably okay with 100 days. Right? Then, uh, of course, uh, it's, uh, it's also so that, uh, that uh, the tax authorities of Denmark will not be able to, uh, to uh, receive this information between, before 2022 or 2021 or something like that. So, uh, so that takes a, a little while. But this, this, has, uh, this has really uh, been the, uh, a, a poster way of, uh, of doing things, and it shows something that, uh, that uh, I'm especially impressed by the Danish unions, that they just do not only say, uh, please uh, uh, leave us alone, we don't want to take any responsibility here, but they actually have gone forward and said, yes, we have a, a role to play here, we will make sure to land this digitalization and disruption into uh, Denmark. Then there's also been a committee on, uh, on internet uh, giant regulation uh, because many of them are uh, acquiring a, a very big uh, monopoly status where they own a lot of the data about us. So, uh, so how to, to do that? Uh, we have a committee on data ethics. Uh, so uh, what can you do and what can't you do with this uh, data? And then we've also been pushing computer literacy into uh, primary and, and secondary school. And it has in the past been very much so a focus on just providing hardware. So if we put a whiteboard in all the public schools and we give every student uh, an iPad, then uh, uh, we must have uh, dealt with this. But no, now there has been a, a large donation from the Danish Industrial Foundation uh, to uh, equip uh, all four graders with a microbot, uh, which is a small uh, integrated circuit they can uh, program in various ways and, and play with the technology. Because we do not only want to be a user nation, we also want to be a nation that creates and builds software builds and creates digital solutions, because otherwise we'll just be a nation that looks at what they do in the US, and they will look at what they do in China, and we'll say, no, 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 that we don't want that. But I think that then we have an obligation to actually provide some solutions that are different from what they're doing in the US and what they're doing uh, in China. And then there's a report, and I'll send that report to you, uh, Elizabeth, uh, called uh, "Prepared for a Future uh, of Work," uh, and uh, and uh, and that uh, addresses uh, some of these uh, issues. I already mentioned uh, something about these uh, mega trends, and uh, mega trends are uh, things that are going to happen inevitably. Uh, but we just don't know exactly how fast it's, it's going to go. Uh, another one could be urbanization. Right? And I'm not talking about moving out of state jobs from the US, no, from the Copenhagen to uh, the rural uh, parts of Denmark. I'm talking about urbanization that in 1700, only 3% of the world's population lived in cities uh, until now, where in 2007, 50% of the world's population lived in uh, cities. Uh, look at the guy, he could be me, uh, 20, 25 years ago, and uh, he's carrying a lot of gadgets, right? So he's got a ghetto blast, he's got a video camera, I couldn't afford that uh, back then, right? So uh, then he's got a radio, he's got a Walkman, he's got uh, a VCR, he's got uh, a typewriter, he's got uh, um, a PC, I guess, and, and stuff like that, right? And all these electronics represented a healthy industry, right? And none of them exist today. they all been subsumed by this killer thing called the smartphone. Right? And the smartphone is a pretty recent invention. It's hard to imagine, but it's only 11 years ago since iPhone, the first iPhone was launched in 2000. I guess it was 2007, so 12 years ago uh, these days. But it was in October, so... Uh, uh, so but that's pretty recent, right? And uh, And... Uh, Anybody here will uh, uh, challenge me that uh, we will not see uh, even bigger changes in the next 12 years? All right. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a lot of changes in the next 12 years. The, the scary part is that I can't imagine what they will be. 
right? So even though that I sit in a very central place where I can play with many of these things, uh, the horizon for which I can envision things is getting shorter and shorter. I know chatbots is coming, AI is coming, and all these kind of things, right? So, uh, but it's going really, really fast. So, uh, so I think there's a Chinese proverb called, uh, may you live in interesting times. And I think that we are indeed living in interesting times. And when I was a young man, I thought of that as a blessing. But now I can also see some of the challenges in living in interesting uh, times. Um, so I'll take you through these uh, mega trends. Uh, so the first one is going from being a retailer to being uh, to facilitating a marketplace. And a retailer, of course, is somebody who will buy up products from some suppliers, put them on the shelves, uh, price market them, or market uh, them with a mark them with a price, and then sell them. They will own the products as long as they're in the uh, in the store, and also they will have the responsibility for having them sold, and also the quality control and all these kind of things. And that's very different from facilitating a marketplace. And of course, here I'm talking about the platformitization of the economy. So uh, when you have a, 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 a marketplace, what you do, and many of you probably go to Yellow Road Market, right? So uh, yes, uh, I've been there several times. Uh, so, uh, so what they do is they facilitate a marketplace. So they have these small booths, they have electricity, they have water, they have sewage, they have uh, fire escapes, they have uh, parking areas, they have some, uh, some uh, entertainment, they have point of sale systems, they have toilets, but they're not involved in the actual buying and selling of goods. That's left to the individual uh, store places, right? So, uh, so they sell and what they do is simply just facilitating. That's a very different mode of uh, operating. And, uh, and in 1937, there was a, uh, an economist who later won the uh, Nobel Prize in economy uh, who uh, was talking about why do we have companies? Why don't we just buy everything on the market? And that's because of transaction costs, the cost associated with transacting in the market. And what we see is that digital technologies are killing these, um, are killing these transaction costs, which is shifting the balance for when to produce something in-house and when to buy something on the market. And that's what we see with these platforms uh, or the platformization of the economy. The next one is going from uh, selling products to selling services. So instead of selling what the product is, we should sell what the product can do. Uh, what is it that it, uh, what pains uh, does it address? How does it uh, work with them? Then the last one is going from uh, ownership to access. So, uh, so when I lived here in Aalborg, I had to have uh, all these CDs to listen to some music that I liked, right? And every, buy, every time I would buy a CD, it would be really expensive, and there would be uh, six to eight tracks on a CD, uh, and I could only listen to those six to eight tracks, and there was actually only one, maybe two tracks on that CD that I really liked. And nowadays, of course, that is very different. But in order to have access, it assumed or presumed that I would also have ownership. So many things we can only enjoy if we own them. And that's also changing. So, uh, so then uh, last year, uh, uh, when the weather was uh, bleak like this, uh, I, I decided uh, or I reflected how often, when was the last time I actually listened to a CD? Right? And you can, you can think about that, and uh, I bet that many of you have hundreds of CDs at home that you haven't listened to in uh, several years. So, uh, so uh, is that correct? Yeah? Yeah, I listened to a CD yesterday. Yesterday. Okay, fantastic, right? So, uh, many of us are not listening to our CDs anymore, right? And I actually didn't even have a CD player anymore. I have a PlayStation 4 in which I guess I, in theory, could have inserted one of the CDs in. So what I did was I took a dramatic decision and I just threw all these uh, CDs into a bag and then I put them out to the curbside because uh, where I live, the municipality comes and collects uh, garbage like that uh, every uh, fourth night. And, uh, and when I put that out there, then I was a little bit interested in seeing because just before the municipality comes, some other people come around too and they look into the bags. Right? And uh, I was looking at uh, what's happening out there and they looked into the bag and then they saw all the CDs and then they closed the bag again. Uh, so maybe you should have been there, right? Because uh, I had uh, two or three hundred CDs sitting there, right? Because uh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, so maybe there could be some that uh, you would find interesting. But at least these guys, they didn't even want them, right? So uh, I actually also did the other dramatic decision that uh, that I also threw out my DVDs. 
right? And you know DVDs, that's 150 kroners a piece. And then you take 10 at a time and throw them into the bag. That really, really hurts, right? But, uh, but nevertheless, uh, that went the same way. They also did not pick up those uh, DVDs. All right, so, uh, so let's have a look. Uh, one of the um, sectors that are going to be hit the hardest uh, by, uh, by this uh, platformization is the finance sector. And uh, uh, the fine, our bank is uh, really just a retailer. They accept some money that we deposit into the bank, then they package them in different ways, and then they lend them out to the other side. But they assume all the, the risk and responsibility. And uh, what's happening here is that uh, all these are um, focused on, uh, on, uh, on uh, cutting away the bank as the middleman and trying to connect people directly uh, between people that would lend me the money out or uh, people that would like to, uh, to borrow some money. We already talked about mobile pay and they became a monopoly, right? So uh, then at CBS we would teach them, uh, you must raise prices now because you have a monopoly situation. Has that happened? No, it's still for free, right? And, uh, and I guess the verdict is still out if they will raise the prices. But let's just think hypothetically that, uh, that we, have, uh, we have Google, right? You probably use Google, right? So, uh, so now uh, Google decides it's going to cost uh, 50 euro cents to uh, search on Google. What will you do? You don't know? What would you do? Well, I would definitely change to Bing in a heartbeat, right? Because yes, Bing is not as good, but uh, we could train them to be as good as Google, right? And especially if it's still for free. So therefore, many of these technologies that have this uh, thing that the marginal cost of serving one more customer is zero, then the right price is also zero. We know that from Google, we know that from Facebook, we know that from LinkedIn and so forth. And many of these, the way they, they, the business model operates is that they would like to be host for the traffic and then that traffic they sell access to to third parties that would like to advertise or something else uh, towards that. And you can just go in and, 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 uh, and uh, assure yourself of that. So, uh, so mobile pay, they also went into uh, to Norway. Right? So in Norway, there was the Norwegian bank uh, and they had a solution called VIPS. And in Norway, Norway is a little bit different from the Danish uh, market, right? So, uh, so uh, they had uh, taught the Norwegians that it should cost one krona to send money using VIPs. Then uh, mobile pay went in, and they went in with a model that was uh, zero or for free to, to, to use. How soon do you think that the Norske, the Norske, Norske Bank had to change their, their uh, pricing? Ten days, yes. That would be even, you know, it was net, it would be five years, you know, because uh, they would have to have a feasibility study and then there were so. But, uh, but uh, no, uh, uh, Norske Bank took a look at the number of downloads in the App Store and then they decided we need to change that and they changed that in six hours. Right, so, uh, so, and that was probably a smart thing, right? Because they could see thousands of people moving over from VIPs to mobile pay, right? So, uh, and, uh, and what about, uh, I think that uh, Spanor is actually uh, moving here, right, uh, in, a, in an area. So uh, mobile pay, is that forever the monopoly? Anybody here with an iPhone? Yeah, many of you have an iPhone, right? So now you can use uh, DenCourt uh, issued by Spanor as well in Apple Pay, right? And there's uh, Google Pay, and there's gonna be Amazon Pay. Uh, the Facebook came out earlier this week and saying they're doing a blockchain-based Facebook pay, right? So, uh, so this is a tough market uh, to be in. Uh, mobile pay is a, is a limited company, so they have to make profit one day. Uh, what about uh, when Apple does Apple Pay, do they need to make money on Apple Pay itself? No, not really. It becomes just an add-on service, right? So uh, in the big picture, the ecosystem have to make a profit, but the individual service does not, right? So, uh, so uh, if I was a mobile pay, I would be a little bit scared uh, from that competition. But that's nothing compared to, uh, to the yellow one. What's the yellow one? Bitcoin, right? They are pretty cheap these days, so maybe it's a time to uh, go in and, uh, and invest your pension funds. Uh, 
Definitely not, right? So, uh, so uh, that's uh, very risky to go in there and uh, and uh, don't do it, right? Uh, not for more money than you, I would think that uh, that uh, similar as uh, as uh, betting on lotto. Uh, that's the amount I would put on uh, on bitcoins, right? But uh, nevertheless, uh, bitcoins are here to stay, and the underlying uh, technology called uh, blockchain is uh, something that will have a big impact. And I usually say that the impact of uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain on the finance sector will be similar to what email has done to the postal services. And then you can decide whether that's a big impact or not. All right, so uh, these all have in, in common that they are moving from uh, being a retailer to facilitating a marketplace. Uh, if you think of most universities, uh, they are also uh, many times uh, retailers and what we will see with many of these online uh, places like Coursera, MOOCs, massive online open courses, then uh, they will also function as, uh, as these platforms. And uh, they don't have to hire people. They just can uh, match people that would like to say something with people that would like to know something. Uh, and, uh, and I think that, uh, that we will see uh, uh, some platforms coming up and, uh, and we'll get back to some of these uh, platforms. I envision uh, in 12 years uh, time that one, some of the most valuable platforms and one of some of the most valuable companies in the world will be learning platforms. Right? I don't know what Aalborg University is going to do about that. All right, next one. From products to uh, services. So instead of selling what a product is, sell what the product can do. Sell the outcome. Uh, so uh, I don't really need, if I'm the airline, I don't really need to have a, a own the plane engine. I just need, I just need what the uh, airplane engine can do for me, and that's uh, airplane uh, propulsion, pushing forward. Uh, so, uh, so uh, yes. The next one is I don't really need to own a truck. I just need some tons moved some kilometers. Next one is uh, from pumps to hot water. I don't really need to have a Grundfos pump. I just need hot water when I open the tap. Even though that Grundfos uh, is the best pump in the world, it's still so that what they are selling uh, is hot water. That's what the users are seeing and that's what they are uh, demanding. Next one is thermostats to comfort. Uh, that's uh, for, for Denfoss. Again, uh, they have uh, the world's best, best uh, thermostats, but what the customers want is a good indoor climate. Good life with diabetes and so forth. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm a homeowner, so uh, I also have a lawnmower. And I was a little bit excited. Uh, no, I was a little bit um, um, anticipating what will happen when I would pull out my lawnmower this uh, this time in, in May. And uh, I pulled the cord and uh, luckily it started because uh, if it hadn't started, I would be in trouble because I'm not a very good uh, lawnmower repair person. Uh, and uh, and uh, if I would have taken it to Bauhaus, there would have been uh, two guys uh, probably working to pay the, the loans or the, the, the tuition uh, and they would even know less about lawnmowers than I would. Right, so uh, so they would say uh, um, I, we don't know what's wrong with it, and we don't really have a workshop here at, uh, at Bauhaus, but we can send it somewhere to have it uh, assessed. That's going to cost 500 kroners, then 600 kroners to have it diagnosed, and then 500 kroners to get it back. We have a really good bargain on buying a new lawnmower over here. Right, and then I would probably have been tempted uh, to buy that lawnmower. Right, so. Um, so uh, um, uh, that's not good for the environment, and that's not a uh, good, uh, good situation. But what I really want is to have a green lawn. Right? So I imagine that in a few years' time, there'll be a service company that will uh, uh, sell green lawns, uh, and then I would buy that, and then they would have a lawn mower that would go into my lawn, uh, do that lawn and then it would go across the street and do that lawn and then into the next door neighbor and do that lawn. And that, I think, will reduce the number of lawn mowers in Denmark dramatically. Right, maybe one hundredth or one two hundredth. Right? Uh, then uh, if uh, the quality would go up, of course, of these lawn mowers because they'll be running uh, much more effectively than, than my lawn mower that doesn't do anything all winter and then it runs for 20 minutes uh, a week. That's not a very effective use of, uh, of the lawn mower. And then um, if anything would break, of course, they would 3D print 
uh, the stuff that they need. Is this a good development for mask? Do you think that's only going to happen for lawnmowers? No, many things will change that way, right? And uh, also it points to the last of the, uh, the, um, the uh, mega trends, and that's going from ownership to access. So I don't have to have ownership to have unlimited access. That's happening already uh, in different steps with cars. So most of the cars today, you know, it's not a very effective use we have of cars, right? My car uh, is used every morning driving to the S train station that takes two and a half minutes or something like that. And then it stands there all day and then uh, it's, it's uh, my wife that's using it. And then she comes back in the afternoon and then she drives back. That's like five minutes use a day. But not a very effective use of a, of a car. But now we have this uh, leasing, that's uh, one step, uh, uh, and then we have uh, go more, that's another step, uh, carpooling and these kind of things. And then in, uh, in Copenhagen, at least, we have this uh, drive now and also uh, um, green mobility, where it's a, a car uh, that you, you find it on your iPad, then you press it and then you learn how clean is it uh, as uh, assessed by the former user. And also, does it have electricity because it's of course, an electrical car uh, to drive you where you want to go. And then you press a little bit harder, and then uh, it's, uh, it's booked for you for the next 30 minutes. And that's a fantastic thing, because I don't need a car, I don't need to own a car, I just need transportation. Right? So that's a, a different way. Okay, let's move on. Uh, platforms. Well, platforms uh, will be the most valuable companies in the world. They also have much fewer employees than traditional companies. So Airbnb is more valuable than Marriott hotels, but they have 2,000 uh, employees in Marriott, while Airbnb only have 5,000. And uh, in a Danish welfare society, what we have uh, uh, hoped for is that it, uh, you know, our taxation of companies have been kind of, a, it's a race towards zero, right? So uh, every time the Swedes lower their, um, their uh, taxation on companies with 1%, we lower it with 2% to stay competitive. And it's only going one way, and that's towards uh, zero. And that used to be okay, because we would get the taxes anyhow by getting the taxes of the income. But look at if the major part of the economy is changing towards being platforms, then there's, even though that the people that work at uh, Airbnb or uh, at PayPal or places like that have a very high salary, the, the pure numbers game makes that the income taxes we can get from that will become uh, lower and lower. So therefore, uh, we have a problem with financing the welfare state in the future if we uh, continue with that. Then uh, platforms are the most valuable ones. So uh, here's 2007 to 2017, and somebody who's uh, fast can see how many repeats are there, how many companies were able to maintain their position at this list. Just two, right? So Microsoft were able to maintain their position, and ExxonMobil fell from being the most valuable one to uh, being the uh, least of the 10 most valuable companies. Right? Um, so uh, so uh, this is happening fast, and since then many of the companies have even changed places. So Microsoft have been the most valuable one, uh, Amazon has been the most valuable one, Apple was the first company in the world to uh, change $1,000 uh, billion, uh, dollars, right? so uh, a massive amount. But then in, in 10 years' time, uh, how many repeats do you think there's going to be there? Yes. Is there anything that should indicate that they will all survive from now on? No, I think a fair estimate would be that there would be two survivors right? that would maintain their position uh, on that list. And then I don't know uh, which one you want to take out. Is it Facebook or Apple or Amazon or Alibaba or Tencent or any of those? Uh, I find that uh, very difficult. Uh, what I do think is that in 10 years' time, um, there's going to be some learning platforms there, right? That will uh, simply just change the way that education is done. Uh, and uh, and uh, that will have a profound impact on the university sector. And of course, we should uh, not act uh, like uh, uh, some places where we would hope that this development will not happen because it will happen inevitably. But like the Danish trade uh, unions, we should think of a way in which we can land this 
to the benefit of the Danes and to the benefit not of the sector, but of as education as a whole. And I know that that's going to hurt a little bit uh, going forward, right? But that will probably happen. Also, it seems like these, uh, using new technologies not, does not necessarily lead to um, massive unemployment. It could be in some countries, but in a country like Denmark, where we have the flexi uh, flex security, that is probably not going to happen uh, because we have this thing. So uh, one of the things in the Danish Disruption Council is um, 834,000 Danes got a new job in 2018. 834,000 Danes got a new job in 2018. That's impressive, right? So we have this vehicle called Flex Security through which we can transform because there's no doubt that this will lead to some un unemployment, but on the overall picture in Denmark, we are able to uh, absorb that uh, through the, our Flex Security system. Then one thing that could be a little bit disturbing here is that uh, what about uh, what about if you look at the Danish uh, C25 index, right? 2007 to 2017, or even 2009 to 2019, how many great new digital platforms have fought its way into the Danish C25 index? Any? No, not really. But that must be because the Danish companies are run so well that we don't have to worry about this. Or could it be that it takes a few years for the same effects as we see in the US before they manifest themselves in the Danish economy? I'm afraid of the last one. Right? So uh, that's why I think that we should have more focus on entrepreneurship more focus on being able to create value using digital technologies and we must teach our students and our graduates these capabilities so that they can go out and help transforming this. It's going to hurt for the established companies, but that's uh, simply a matter of fact. It's the creative uh, destruction. Okay, the future labor market, more will be uh, contract workers self-employed. Uh, they will have several employees at the same time. So uh, today, most of us have one contract with one employer, but in the future, you'll have several contracts with several employers. Uh, you will uh, be rewarded according to the outputs and not the inputs. Um, uh, you will uh, vary your efforts over time. So sometimes you would like to work a lot, and sometimes on a day like today, it's okay to put in 12 hours, isn't it? Uh, and then uh, on a nice day when it's sunny, uh, you can put in a, a, a lot less. Uh, and then maybe I, I'm one person that I would like to work more in the winter and have less uh, or work in the summer. The thing is that uh, that uh, is a challenge to us is that you will be part of a global workforce and be remunerated accordingly. So we no longer uh, can totally control how we distribute uh, the salaries in, in a Danish uh, society. Um, then uh, they will be constant uh, uh, assessed and that's much more valuable than their uh, formal uh, education. I already mentioned some of the um, some of the challenges with uh, moving to this uh, these platforms and uh, and uh, if you are self-employed, what about uh, sick pay? Um, what about pension? Uh, so I'm uh, I'm at least of that uh, um, conviction that uh, that I'm not uh, I don't think that people should have the possibility of working without uh, saving up for their pension because I don't want to see uh, poor people uh, in the streets of Denmark. Right. So therefore, I must insist that the, we all save up to our pension uh, sometime, and I don't want uh, people to be able not to do that. I also believe that it's important with a paid holiday, parental leave, skills upgrading, uh, and, uh, and these concerns must be addressed and protected. And that's why I think that uh, what the unions are doing by doing these trade agreements also with the platforms are showing the way uh, forward. Top Coder is a platform uh, and that connects people that would like to have built software with people that can build software. There's more than one million people on that platform. They work or they are situated uh, anywhere in the world. So there's a lot of people from China, from Indonesia, from Russia, from India, who is selling their skills of developing software. So if you would like to have an app 
uh, made, then you can describe what app you would like to have uh, made, and then there are several teams that will compete to uh, be able to develop this app. Then, uh, yes, so uh, uh, then uh, money is being uh, paid to the one that will win. Uh, but many uh, people, in, uh, especially in the third world, that do not have access to formal education, they also engage in the top coder community to learn. That way, uh, they, uh, get, uh, um, uh, they get um, uh, critical skills, and then they are constantly being assessed by their co-project um, uh, members and saying he's very good or she's very good at uh, Python programming or uh, he's very good at uh, doing uh, architecture and stuff like that. And then when your rating gets up, then you just might get that phone call saying, hi, this is uh, Google. Why don't you leave that uh, um, village in Indonesia and come to uh, work with us in, uh, in Redmond in, uh, in the US and we'll give you a nice salary. Right? So that's another way of acquiring these uh, things. So uh, I think this is very positive and seen from a democratic uh, point of view. I think that many are thinking about how digitalization will, um, will um, uh, influence the way that we do things right now. But they think about the whole global movement where many more people will have access to educational services in the future. It's not going to be just for the privileged uh, few. I think there's a video there, but uh, I'll skip that video in the interest of time and just move to that one. That's what I would want to do uh, if I was a young person. Uh, when I was a young person, I would have to take a backpack and then go traveling for one year, but uh, because I didn't have the possibility of a remote year. A remote year is where you keep your job, right? but you agree with your, uh, with your uh, employer that you can work from a distance. So, uh, so what you do is you, uh, you uh, go on this, it costs $5,000 to sign up and then $1,000 a, uh, a month, and then you visit uh, 12 great cities and spend one month there each. All right, so uh, so then, then you have the workplace uh, and, uh, and then you have a good time and live in Singapore, live in Beijing, live in Mexico City, New York City, Zurich, uh, Munich, uh, Copenhagen, Oslo, Helsinki. You pick these uh, places, right? And then you work from these places. And then there's a fast internet connection as well. I think that could be fun. Yes. Artificial intelligence. So, uh, so anything that's repetitive can be automated using uh, uh, artificial intelligence. And, uh, and I'm afraid that it's not only uh, what blue collar workers do, it's also what white work, uh, workers uh, do, where that usually required some university training to be able to do, perform certain tasks. Computers can do it better. They can also do it more fairly. I saw these appalling uh, statistics about when your, um, when your parole was coming up uh, in, uh, uh, for the judges. Right? If it was early in the morning, uh, the likelihood of you getting parole was uh, pretty good, but it was just before lunch, like now, uh, they would be pretty grumpy, right? and therefore the likelihood of you getting it uh, was not very high. Uh, what we can ask computers to do is to make some of these judgments. Uh, and they can do anything that's repetitive. And I think that it's not the things that are more interesting that's left for us. I think many of the interesting things will go to the computers, and what will be left for us is the anomalies, things that fall out of what is common. And that's not necessarily interesting. That can just be hard sometimes. All right, then conclusions. Um, Problem-based learning, as you might, can, uh, might uh, can guess, I think that uh, that will remain. Uh, and, uh, and you could say for everything else, there's uh, artificial intelligence. All right, so going back to the, 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 the slogan of uh, um, uh, for everything else, there's MasterCard. And uh, for this, it's just AI. And, uh, and for everything else, there's PBL. Or for the other way around, PBL will be there. Uh, disruption of learning, these learning platforms, but also remember the democratization of, of learning and then digitalization must be landed. I don't have time right to, uh, to give a good example there, but just think about uh, that. Uh, that the, can I do it? Shortly? Okay, so, uh, so I was giving this presentation once and there was a, a person who came up and he said he was actually in charge of implementing 
uh, e-post, email, in the Danish postal services in the 1990s. And that shouldn't be just for everybody. That should be only for the companies. And uh, it uh, should, of course, cost something to send an email. How much do you think that it, that would be? A stamp, of course, right? Not to create a better competitive uh, environment for email than for the postal services. And then I suggested to him, um, maybe uh, it should also be so that you don't deliver the email right away. <laughs> that it should uh, rest on the server, right? And he was, uh, he was laughing, but I'm pretty sure that uh, that would be the case, that they would only deliver emails twice a day. Right? So sometimes uh, we think that the established business models is also the right way when going forward. But that kind of um, uh, uh, is not uh, the right way uh, that we should go. Instead, we should try to look at what are the possibilities of these new technologies, and then we should land the established companies into that reality instead of doing the adverse, namely saying what we have built up of business models over the last 150 years is the right one, and then we will force like insisting on seat sensors and taxi meters in Uber taxis into that world, right? We should do the uh, adverse. All right, thanks a lot for your attention.